everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about story-driven uh, casual games for personalization and how to design them. Uh, that is a mouthful. I can't even say it correctly, but we're going to walk our way through it. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is get to know each other and talk about the problem space a little bit. Then we'll really dig deep into why personalization matters and then uh, uh, why it's a challenge for story-driven games in particular. And finally, I'd like to share with you our experimental solution. I'm super excited about this. So, I'm Dave. Uh, I've been in the game industry for about 14 years. Uh, my very first game was on console. Uh, then I switched over to children's MMOs. And uh, then uh, finally, uh, the free-to-play mobile space. Uh, and I'm happy to say for the last five years, I've been working with Wooga, uh, and I was the production lead designer on June's Journey and also the economy designer on June's Journey. Um, I can't talk about the game I'm currently working on, but I'm going to share some stuff from it. Um, so I have to be careful with how I proceed. So let's unpack uh, this giant name. Uh, first of all, this talk is about personalization. And so I don't mean decorating on an island or pimping up your ride. What I really mean is how do we segment the game and morph the game so it fits our players' needs better? Uh, we are a story-driven game uh, company. In fact, uh, we are the leading uh, game in the hidden object genre. And um, we build games for people like Renda here uh, who don't necessarily consider themselves gamers, but do want to pick up something and play and are very loyal because of it. But why is a designer talking about personalization? Isn't that really for data science? Well, I'll start with a story of how uh, a good friend of mine who I actually worked with, uh, with on Dragonvale uh, was a producer for tech and came to me with this question. We have a machine learning solution ready to go, but the game teams can't do anything with it. What are you going to do about this? I didn't have a good answer for him now, but we're working on a good answer, which is we need to actually build a game with personalization in mind from the very beginning. So, one of the things that I'd like to unpack in this talk and talk about is, should we fit the game to the players or should we fit the players to the game? Uh, and a spoiler, the answer is yes, but the details matter. Uh, so uh, to give a little bit more context of why we're talking about this, uh, we all live by this funnel. You may be familiar with it. You have impressions, store page, uh, the actual funnel of the gameplay, and then uh, day one retention and on. And uh, if we're working together as a group, this all becomes one integrated experience. But um, we just drop people left and right all the way through this experience. And if we can actually uh, bend the trajectories of people with our game by personalizing the game to them, then uh, all of our KPIs look better in the future. OK. so. Often when we're talking about story-driven games or uh, maybe even another content-driven game like a match-free game, we are presented with a bit of a dilemma. We seems like a monetization and churn are two sides of the very same coin. When we try to increase monetization, we increase churn. When we try to decrease churn, we also decrease monetization. But I do believe there's a balance to be found. And uh, finding that balance, um, uh, rests on us understanding players' behavior within the game itself. So I'd like to talk to you about what I call the engagement ladder, which is when people come into the game, they don't know anything about you or the game at all. Um, but uh, they give it a little bit of a try. Maybe they start to like it a little bit, and they start to retain. They come back another day. Then they really start to like it, and you can consider them more and more engaged. And then after somebody really likes the game, they might consider committing to the game, which means VIPs don't just come to the game. They're actually made. The, the game uh, converts them, and not all VIPs work for all games. Uh, so the, now we're getting to the actual navigation of this talk. Um, we have uh, uh, just scratched the surface of personalization as an industry. Um, and I would like to talk about all the different layers. Uh, so we'll start with sales and offers, and then we'll talk about events, uh, dynamic difficulty, and then finally uh, personalization in the core loop. Um, these things get dramatically more difficult uh, the deeper you go. And honestly, sales and offers is going to give you the biggest bang for the buck. So we probably won't even spend that much time talking about it. 
Okay, so for sales and offers, uh, you can see here uh, we're offering some red pandas for $5. Uh, we can do personalization here. There's actually a lot of different talks, uh, a lot of different product talks about how to do this. I don't want to add too much to it other than to say, yes, it's a good idea, and you should just go ahead and do it. But also bear in mind that there's a, a couple more things to think about. Players often share screenshots, and that means that they're gonna know that somebody got a different deal than they did. And so you need to have a communication plan ahead of time. How about you're gonna talk about this? And then I would say, consider having a VIP program, because the thing that doesn't feel good about these kind of unfair offers is that you don't know why you were chosen to get one offer versus another. And if you can brand something as, you're getting this because you're a special customer, then it feels much more, um, much more empowering and you feel like you're in control of the decisions. Okay, uh, so that was talking about sales and offers. Let's go one step deeper and talk about events. Events are uh, things that are by nature, uh, usually outside of the core loop, although I think we're getting them more and more integrated in the core loop. And it really, uh, there's a lot of value in personalizing events. But you're gonna have to do your homework first. So my very first event was uh, Dragon Vale Light and Dark. Uh, it was many years ago, but maybe eight years ago. Uh, events weren't new then, uh, but it was my first event and I learned a lot of things from it. So some things that we got right is that we integrated uh, the event into the core loop. So as you play the game, you made progress in the, uh, an event automatically. This is pretty key. And we had some milestone rewards to keep people interested. Some things that didn't go so long uh, so well is that it was just too long. Uh, players got bored or they finished early. And it was a community event, which meant that um, the players were dependent on other people contributing. And what that really means is nobody feels like they're actually adding much. It's hard to contribute in any ways that's significant if you have 100,000 other people contributing to the same event. And then finally, there was a single balancing. Now, this is typical with events, and this is actually one of the core issues. You have to get over this idea that there's a single balancing for everybody. That's just not personalization. So here's an event from June's Journey. Uh, you can see that it's a fairly typical event. In fact, most events involve some sort of filling a bar. Um, uh, UI artists do a lot of different ways of co uh, communicating this bar filling in different metaphors, but it's usually filling a bar. And you're earning a currency by engaging uh, to fill up that bar. That is bog standard events. But another thing I'd like to point out that maybe isn't so obvious is that there's a time left and there's how many currency that you need to acquire. That's a contract. And you actually have to hold to that contract with those players. And this is something that'll come up in the future as well. When you make a contract with a player, we have to hold to it. Okay, well, what happens if we could actually personalize events to a player with a calendar? So imagine you have your typical Halloween event, and this is a two week long event. And then somebody comes in at this point. What do you do? Uh, what I think is the right uh, approach is to actually rebalance at that moment the event so that they have this many days to complete it so they have a fair shot because you want to get as many people involved in trying to win the event as possible. And that means that you need to, once again, think about that engagement letter. People are going to need to come in and feel like I can make progress before you can get them to the next step of engagement, which is to challenge them a little bit harder. Here's an, another example of how that might work. You, as a single player, have an easy event one weekend, an engagement event the next weekend, and then finally a monetization event, something that really challenges you to see, hey, is this player gonna make it to the next step? The reason why I bring this up is because you actually need a system that is able to create events of different sizes, so you need a very good economy model. And then uh, when you log in uh, to the game, it needs to assign the correct event for you. And then if you do have a global event like the Halloween event, uh, that system just has to be aware of this calendar and work itself around that. I think these are fairly solvable problems, but easier said than done. Okay, so we've talked about uh, events, uh, and now let's go one step deeper. Uh, this is where you're actually getting into the core gameplay and determining whether or not uh, somebody has a particular skill level. Now, not all core gameplays require this amount of, of balancing, but match three, there's actually quite a bit of research in it, and not much to my knowledge has been done in hidden objects. So I'd like to share with you the results of some experimentation we had with dynamic difficulty. So uh, we made a, um, we made a prototype scene, and this scene had a lot of objects, several hundred objects. Our uh, artist is very good at hiding things, and they're not all shown here. 
Um, and then we just gave it to people and had them play it. But how do we actually uh, figure out how good somebody is at playing HO gameplay? It turns out it's really simple. We tell them to find 10 objects, then we just average the amount of time it takes them to find those 10 objects. That's roughly their skill. And then uh, we just uh, add more and more objects until we don't think they can uh, find all the objects again in a three minute timer. So we did this experience, uh, experiment with Wugas. We gave them a scene, we had them play a series of five rounds and we increased the amount of time uh, that required or the amount of objects required uh, in each round until eventually in the final round it was supposed to be unbeatable because uh, we asked for more objects than they had time. This is the, re the results of the test. And as you can see, when we asked for 60 seconds of objects, people had no difficulties whatsoever. And then when we asked for more than three minutes, 220 seconds, there was still plenty of people finishing it. Uh, and, but I'd like to point out that that gap, that very massive gap, is actually uh, a demonstration of the skill. So there is actually a large skill component in hidden object gameplay. And we need to correct for that if we're gonna have dynamic uh, balancing. So we took exactly the same setup, and then we went out to uh, Playtest Cloud. I gotta give them a shout out. Uh, they're in Potsdam and they're a really good service. And we had real players uh, in our target market play this exact same setup. And uh, thankfully, whew, uh, they were failing as scheduled. Uh, and as you can see, many of them, um, nobody actually finished round five, uh, which is exactly how it should have been. So we found out that yes, skill really plays a large part, a big factor in, um, in HO gameplay, but we need to really split uh, the skill portion from the, the challenge portion because uh, we want to give everybody essentially the same challenge. So you'll see this jiggity jaggedy line is, um, is actually the typical sawtooth curve for difficulty and we have it growing until it eventually goes up and meets the three minute timer and that will uh, challenge people uh, heavily and maybe even get them to use boosters or whatever to win the level when they're really challenged by time. But that sawtooth curve should be the same for everybody regardless of their skill level. So we wanna actually divorce the challenge that we provide you with this single line from uh, your skill level. And we just do that by adding or subtracting uh, objects to find, uh, or difficulty of objects to find, until uh, we feel that you're going to hit this median. Okay, so now we've gotten through all the easy surface stuff, now we're really gonna dig into the core loop stuff. Uh, and because this is a design talk, we're gonna focus mostly on uh, problem space, but then we can get to the solution, uh, at least our experimental solution at the end. First off, I'd like to talk to you about spreadsheet problems. This might be a bit controversial. Uh, the last uh, economy model I made was in a spreadsheet, and I am a friend of, of uh, find and match as much as anybody else. But there are some limitations to spreadsheets that I think we should explore. Okay, so this is a screenshot from the economy model of June's journey. Um, it's uh, I think a fairly typical uh, balancing spreadsheet. Uh, you've got a, a little bit of a visualization and you've got some tabulations, but immediately you can see, oh my goodness, that's a lot. Uh, it's a lot to take on and it actually takes quite a bit of training to uh, transfer this knowledge from one designer to another designer. But there's inherent problems in solving this uh, or uh, making an economy model this way. One of the ways is this, this is actually code and it's bad code. Uh, that gobbledygook on the top is unreadable, but it is essentially functioning the same way the code would. And worse, this is not code in our game, this is code in a spreadsheet somewhere and somebody has to translate this to the game on a repeated basis and it's two different people because one is an economy designer and the other person is an engineer and now you've already got issues where you could have communication problems and two people holding halves at the same problem. We really should think how can we bring this together so we can communicate better as a team about what is really going into our economy. Uh, so another problem I have with spreadsheets, uh, I'm actually going to have to tell you uh, about uh, an actual uh, feature in June's Journey uh, to illustrate. And, and that feature is uh, bush gifting. So we have a feature where uh, you can visit other people's islands. Here I'm visiting Found and Abound. And you can give them a bush. And so if you just tap on that, you give a bush. 
And then they have now uh, this uh, bush that they can find on their island, and uh, they can collect it to get hard currency. And so it's a way for players to give each other uh, diamonds, our hard currency. And uh, when you can give all the bushes uh, up to a maximum of 14 diamonds a day, that's actually very lucrative for the free player. It's up to 70 cents every single day in, in free hard currency. So everybody should do, be doing that, right? Well, it turns out, no, not everybody's doing it. In fact, the feature has a fairly low um, adoption rate, which means that 60% uh, of the players don't ever get any diamonds whatsoever and uh, a very small sliver get the full 14 diamonds every day. So that might be a producer or product manager problem, but we also have some modeling issues that come with this. And I finally have uh, a, a way to describe this, a name for this, and it's called the Simpsons Paradox. Here you can see uh, we've got some options um, about how we can plan on, on modeling this. And uh, one thing you could possibly do is just split the difference. And you just say everybody gets seven diamonds. But we know that's not true. We know it's absolutely false. Either you get zero diamonds, which is 60% of you, or a very small sliver get 14 diamonds. How do you actually model this? Uh, and I, I, I finally have the name, which is Simpson's Paradox. That is a... Uh, that is uh, a, a mathematical concept when you have a data set that isn't bell-shaped. In fact, it's the opposite direction. When you try to um, make a median out of it, when you try to aggregate it, it gives you completely false data. And I think this is an example of Simpson's paradox, and we have this all the time when we're doing economy modeling, which leads us to the next problem, which is economy models are full of assumptions. Uh, I call this the holy assumption because it's basically how do we think people are going to play in the game. Now, it had a little bit of um, information from benchmarking uh, other hidden object games, but still, uh, it's, it's a pretty big assumption to think that everybody's going to play this way. Well, you say you could, you could just make more models and more models, and, and you keep uh, splitting it and splitting it and splitting it, and eventually, how are you going to deal with this many different uh, features and, and play patterns that all diverge from each other? And this is actually the core problem of what personalization has to solve. How do you deal with this complexity? Okay, well, that's one problem, which is spreadsheet problems. The next problem is migration problems. Uh, because let's say you get a personalization engine in and working in your game. Now you've got to actually work with it with a player in a live environment. Uh, we call this, uh, when you're changing from one configuration to another, we call this migration. And this causes as engineers to have terrible headaches. It's a lot of work and it's very error prone. This isn't going to go away. Uh, in fact, we have to get good at it. And I'd just like to point out, back to that player contract, every single time you see a number in the game, every single time you see a value, that's a contract we have with the player and we have to maintain it. So imagine this is your experience bar. This is the progress you've made. But you, we, we transfer you to a configuration where you actually need more experience to get to the next level. How do we maintain this contract? We have to prorate the uh, progress that you've made in the level. So now you have more experience to go, but uh, your percentage of progress was not changed in any way. Um, this, uh, this is a really tricky problem to solve, and you have to do it case by case, and you just have to think about every single time a player sees a number in their UI, uh, you have to hold that number true. It's important because this is how the player understands how to play your game. It, it's the key information. Uh, so you can change the ground underneath them, but their goals can't change. Okay, so now you've got a migration issue, uh, or migration issue solved. You can go uh, from balancing to balancing to balancing and just take them all the way up the difficulty curve. You should just do that, right? It's not so easy, and, it's not, and we should be careful about that because the players actually have always a fundamental choice to engage or not engage. That I like to call the gas pedal. We want players to engage more, but they need the feedback of engaging more was worth it. So if you uh, see that somebody's playing five times as much and you immediately make the game five times as hard, you just took away that gas pedal. They no longer have the feeling of, hey, if I work harder, I get the rewards I want. So you have to be very careful when you apply this because remember, we're trying to get players to reach higher and higher levels of engagement so eventually they monetize. 
But that's a step, every step of the journey, they need to have that, that gas pedal, that feedback uh, ready for them. OK, I'd like to jump into some ethical considerations really quickly. Uh, there is actually uh, some stuff you should think about ahead of time if you're going to take the leap and, and, and make personalization enter into the core loop of your game. Um, first and foremost, uh, you, if you're going to sell something, uh, you should actually give them a reasonable chance of winning every time. Uh, I know a lot of games use baked randomness, but I don't think it's very ethical to sell somebody a lottery ticket you know is a loser. Um, you should make sure that everybody has a fair chance at event rewards. Uh, and the reason for this uh, isn't just ethical, it's, I think, also a business decision. At least in, uh, in Wooga, we want to keep our customers for years and years and years. And if they get the feeling that events are only being winnable by money, eventually they'll stop engaging. And we've lost all of that effort we've made into the engagement ladder of getting them to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. Uh, we remain a uh, free-to-play game forever, so uh, this is a decision that Wooga's made uh, because we believe that uh, every single customer counts uh, and every player is actually a customer because first and foremost, they talk about the game, so they're actually part of our advertising strategy. Uh, if we have good organics, and we do, then it actually lowers the overall cost for us to acquire new users. Secondly, they watch video ads, and uh, we retain for years. So that actually adds up to a significant amount of money. And finally, uh, you know, as long as somebody's still playing the game, we still have a chance to convert them. And that is the hard work of live ops, but I really think it's uh, worth doing, because eventually, somebody has a price. All right, so let's talk about story-driven challenges. Um, stories are uh, naturally linear things. Uh, plot elements want to go one after another, and it doesn't make a lot of sense if they don't. Uh, stories need a particular pacing. Uh, you need to uh, be able to follow along with what's going on so you don't forget the thread, you don't forget who this person is. So you need to get story at irregular uh, intervals. Uh, and stories themselves are not flexible once written, uh, really not flexible because they're also the very top of our content pipeline, a very long pipeline. We have characters and scenes and props and all of these things need to be built way in advance. We call that the content treadmill, which is great for uh, long-term employment, but difficult to actually change how the game works in the mid, uh, in the mid time. So you, this is the game you have, you have to work with what you have, so you need to plan ahead. So here are some tips that I've learned from our, our head of writing, uh, Rebecca Harwick, about how designers and writers can work together uh, in the most fruitful way. Uh, first of all, use verbs as the connection to gameplay. It's actually a pretty simple concept. Uh, the gameplay is gonna be things like fight, or in our case, find, search, talk. These are the verbs that the player is doing uh, in the game, and when the story uses these same verbs, then that puts the player within the game, and the player is actually acting out what's happening in the story. And that just makes the entire thing resonate so much better. There is a really good talk given by uh, Caitlin Tremblay um, for the GDC, it just came out this year. I, I recommend giving that a watch for a little bit more depth on the subject. Um, so working with writers, some other stuff. Uh, agree on the narrative tools early. Uh, how are writers are going to deliver the story? And, and this needs to be very specific. How many lines do they have? How many words in each line? But also, how often in the gameplay do they get the story delivered to them? Because that really limits your ability to uh, personalize. Uh, hire professionals, especially game writing professionals. Uh, it's amazing what the experience of actually writing for a game is different from other writing. We obviously uh, are, are appreciate any talented writer, but uh, we first hire uh, game writing professionals so that they can pass on that knowledge. Uh, pipelines thrive with rigid constraints. You cannot double the production in the pipeline and you can't cut the production in the pipeline. It just delivers the content it delivers, so you have to be sure that you have enough content. And so you need actually a very predictive economy model way in advance so that you're not wasting a whole lot of people's money and time. And finally, uh, the beginning of the game, what I call the first time user experience, is everybody's responsibility. You need to start on that early and uh, when a story driven game, it's really important because that's how you introduce uh, characters and also the, pl uh, the hook of the story. Okay, uh, final problem space, social media. Um, 
people are gonna compare screenshots with each other and they're gonna complain about it on Facebook. Uh, part of this is just a band-aid you gotta rip off. You should have a plan of how you're gonna deal with this, but if you're really personalizing your game, then there are things you can do to make sure that their two experiences are not very comparable. Um, you, it depends on your core loop, it depends on your UI, but just think, keep this in mind as you're personalizing. What happens when these two players compare their screenshots? Will somebody feel upset? All right, so we've talked through the problem space of, um, of personalizing within the core loop. Now I'm really excited to tell you about uh, our experimental solution. It's still early days, we're in the middle of production, but so far the results are very promising. So I'd like to introduce you to SimWell, our simulation system. It starts with player profiles. Uh, player profiles is essentially how we think players are gonna play. Uh, we run them through uh, the game rules as a black box. So this is the actual game, uh, but uh, in, a, in a simplified form. And then we check it against uh, progression milestones that we think the player should hit at a particular point. Now, if you've done uh, economy uh, spreadsheet modeling, you know what this looks like. You just kind of look down the rows and say, hey, if I was this player, how would this feel? But this is um, a much more um, organic version of this. And I'd like to just go through uh, the different components of it. Oh, and finally, uh, when we see that players aren't meeting the, the milestones we think, then we go back and tweak the game rules and run it again. So we're really running the player through simulations of the game. So what are these player profiles? Well, uh, uh, my um, uh, lead engineer, Stefan, uh, described it as this. They're artificial stupidity agents. They don't play smart. We don't want them to play smart. We want them to do very specific things so we can understand their behavior. They play the cheapest scene over and over and over again. Whatever's the cheapest, they play it. Or they only file the main quest. Uh, they never get distracted. Or they spend money every chance they get, and uh, then you can find out uh, how much money the, uh, the, the total game could possibly make, which is interesting, even if theoretical. Or the opposite, uh, they, they hoard every health potion they have, they ground out every currency, they never use any boosters. What does their experience look like? So why not use machine learning? I'm sure some of you are already thinking about this. Where does machine learning fit? Well, the truth is machine learning today, the machine does all the learning. And we actually wanna learn what the player experience is before we have players. And um, the machine learning unfortunately uh, abstracts all of that away. Okay, so what about the black box itself? Uh, well, the black box itself is really actually the game client. It's just, uh, it's just the configs and the game rules running together. Um, it runs in a headless mode, which means there's a new OUI, uh, so it runs very, very fast. Um, it's deterministic, so uh, we can take out randomness uh, as a, a variable factor in our simulations, and then we could try tweaking a value, running it again, and seeing if the same setup what the changes will be. Uh, and then it's swappable, and that gets down to that migration problem. You need to be able to swap in and out um, different headless clients to see how those experiences changes. And then long term, uh, we can have a client run a certain direction, hit a point in the progression, and then swap out uh, configs so that we can start working on, hey, what happens when we actually personalize in the middle of somebody's player journey their experience? So uh, we did have to actually do some abstractions because uh, teaching a bot to find hidden objects is either a university problem or the path to madness. So uh, we just use simple die rolls. So uh, we have a difficulty curve coming in and we just roll a die and see whether or not the, uh, the bot was lucky that time uh, because uh, we just need to abstract that away. And we can do the same thing for the bush gifting or other kinds of maybe the player does, maybe the player doesn't experiences. We just abstract it to a die roll. And then finally, we have progression milestones. And now visualizing progression milestones has been really a bit of a challenge. Uh, but uh, the light came on uh, when uh, Vlad, um, our data scientist, uh, just showed me this. This was in, uh, in an internal documentation where we just were able to look at a particular player's journey. So here you see a June's Journey player, but only in the terms of the uh, days played. Uh, that would be the dark marks is uh, overnights and uh, the light marks are uh, individual days. And then just the single currency, which is our main progression currency, their flowers. And 
it, since it's a main progression currency and it's a threshold, it just goes up and up and up and up, which you'd expect to see. But now, if you compare that at the same time to another currency, and this is that player's energy currency, you can see that the player is playing reasonably the same amount of sessions. The energy bar fills up, goes down, fills up, goes down. You don't see any hoarding happening here, and uh, the player is always playing through the entire energy bar every session. This is what we want to see, but it's actually visual to us. Finally, there's diamonds. OK, diamonds. Uh, diamonds are a, a very rare currency, and so players naturally hoard them. But you can see that this player will, is willing to go down to zero uh, when she finds something she, that she really wants. And then we have a soft currency, coins. Uh, now, this player, uh, if, you, if you know what to look for, can, you can tell that this player has actually deepened the progression of June's journey. because. Uh, our difficulty scales up over time, and at about year one or two mark, you start needing more and more coins in order to progress. And so it's a lot of grinding to get those coins, and then boom, spending them all at once. So how are we going to get all of this information in a way that we can consume it? I'd like to introduce you the crazy idea of bot happiness. We're going to program uh, our agents to tell us whether or not they like playing the game. So we're going to tell it things it likes, like playing dialogues and finishing quests, and that's going to increase its bot happiness, which will then map to a um, dashboard. And then we're also going to tell it what it doesn't like, like grinding without progress or losing events. Now, this is an abstraction of all those other variables in a player journey that hopefully gives us a single signal that tells us where are the pinch points in our game, where is the balancing off, and uh, what can we do uh, to make the experience much, much better deep in the game. I have a confession to make. Uh, I was the lead designer of June's Journey, and I've never made it past chapter 20. I'm never going to finish this game. There's years and years and years of content, but we just had the trust that the systems would hold in the long term. And this is a way of gaining that trust. So that is our simulation system, uh, Simwell. Uh, you just basically tell uh, fake players to play your game and tell you what you think. Uh, but I'm really excited about this, uh, and I'd like to share with you some initial results we already have. So we uh, have been able to get the game client to migrate uh, successfully across multiple configurations, so we feel that problem is well on its way to being solved. We can simulate a years of gameplay in just a few minutes. Um, we're still struggling with the visualization uh, of the data, uh, and we're already finding that it's very useful uh, for deep testing of the game. Uh, we can actually uh, see much deeper into the game than we ever could before. Uh, so, to answer the initial question, should we fit the game to the players or fit players to the game? The answer is yes. Uh, we should fit the game to a broader market as possible. And then over time, using personalization, we can actually encourage them to become bigger and bigger fans of the game and then eventually become customers. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, looking forward to your questions. The first question came from Maria, uh, and the question was, uh, what do you think personally about personalized difficulty? Uh, I've actually been in the games industry for about 14 years, and we've been in some way or another working on personalized difficulty the whole time. I think there's a very big difference to be made between uh, multiplayer games and single player games. In multiplayer games, obviously, it has to be fair across the board. Your skill is your skill, and that's the whole point while you're playing with multiple people. But on single player games, uh, there's a ton of personalization. A very old school uh, version of this is um, <clears throat> every single time somebody dies, you start them over with just a little bit more life every time. Usually you try to make this indistinguishable because the whole point is people are challenging themselves. And we're just really trying to make it so everybody, the broadest amount of people can have a, uh, a fun experience. Obviously that's not true uh, with uh, with some of the more hardcore games. Ah, um, I have a, another question from Tatiana. Um, thank you for the speech. Uh, according to your experience, how long does it take to transfer you from fan to customer uh, in your games? Um, as some people, they just know it's immediately they're a fan. Uh, that shows up in a lot of ways, but one of the most obvious ones is they buy the, uh, the welcome package because we don't have a balancing that requires you to spend currency immediately, obviously. But they know they like the game and they want to invest in it and they, they, they vote with their dollars, so to speak. So those people are the few in the far between, uh, but they're there. Um, for others, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, there's actually kind of a 
a personal story. Uh, one of our data scientists, his name is Marcus, and he's been playing the game since the very beginning, but he never wanted to, um, to decorate, which is a big part of Jim's journey. But recently, the last year, he started decorating this entire island. So I say it's an ongoing process. Uh, as long as somebody's logging in every day, they're a fan, and then it's just to the next step and to the next step. Eventually, we can get them to buy the T-shirt. Thank you for the question. Well, um, so Nikita, I don't see uh, any other questions coming. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, All right. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for sticking thank with you. us. Uh, and thank you for your talk and for uh, the answering of the questions.